It's an honor for me to be here with you today, and I think it's a tremendous accomplishment of uh, the organizers of ISU and of the people from many nations who have uh, come here and made this first session of the International Space University such a success as it already is. I'm first going to speak today of the imperative transcendent reasons for opening the solar system to human life on a large scale, then of some practical economic methods, and then even of politics, about which I rarely speak. The five transcendent goals that I believe in very strongly are first generating wealth to improve human life on Earth, second preserving and protecting the environment of our planet, supplying unlimited clean energy to the Earth, opening the door to a new frontier which is rich in opportunity for you and for uh, the children of yourselves and of those of us of the older generations, and reducing the causes of wars. Those are goals that transcend national boundaries. They represent all of humanity's noblest aspirations, and they affect directly the lives of every human being. You, some of you know that the Space Studies Institute is a nonprofit foundation set up to work toward these goals. It's action-oriented, and it uh, is critically dependent on the work of volunteers and contributors, reasons, I think, why it has been stable and effective for its 10 years of life. It's also rather unique among private space organizations in having a long-term prospect of large-scale financing of that more later. I'd like now to show you an SSI uh, show which is used by its volunteers to show how vital and how productive the space frontier can be. The purpose of that show is, is to indicate that space is not only relevant to our society, but is essential to it. We can have both industrial growth and a clean environment. We can have economic growth not only in the first world, but in the second and the third worlds as well. The space frontier can develop uh, and provide for the Earth clean energy in abundance for growth. The concept of satellite solar power, uh, invented by Dr. Peter Glazer, who is with us today, and uh, made practical in part by the essentials of the transmission method, on which uh, Dr. William Brown, who's also with us today, has uh, spent years of development. Uh, that is a practicality. It can be done using the materials which are available from the lunar surface to construct large solar power satellites in space. It is very important from an economic viewpoint as well. It's a new industry with a potential of $400 billion per year as an export market for the nation or nations that choose to establish that industry in space. Those are the annual needs of the world for new electric generators, the annual needs alone. A word on the future funding of the Space Studies Institute, which was spoken about a moment ago. In founding the Geostar Satellite Corporation uh, five years ago, my family and I allocated about 85% of the founding stock in Geostar to the Space Studies Institute. Geostar has, is doing rather well. It uh, launched its first satellite in March of this year. It's now providing service throughout the United States, and uh, there, are, uh, there are licensed uh, duplications of the Geostar system, which are being uh, spoken about for Europe, Australia, the People's Republic of China, and other places. The market valuation of Geostar at the moment is about $200 million, although it is uh, still a private company, and the Space Studies Institute owns uh, somewhat more than 10 percent of that corporation. It's by far the largest individual shareholder. I should hasten to add that uh, that is not yet publicly traded stock, and it doesn't mean that SSI doesn't require and need uh, immense help 
from volunteers as it is now getting. It will need that for some years to come. The transcendent goals that I listed first are the goals of the Space Studies Institute to be achieved, we think, by quiet, patient, hard work. First, science and engineering research, then action programs in space. And SSI is already beginning to plan such programs. You people here at ISU will be developing ambitious plans and programs, uh, I think, of the kind that uh, SSI very much wants to uh, help in, in any way possible. But the goals that SSI has set up are international. Every nation can subscribe to them wholeheartedly. They're also international in scope, most suitable, I believe, for international cooperation. And here, just a note on politics. There has been much talk, and has been for a long time, of several possible alternatives for large-scale, long-term international space programs. I think what's unique about the opening of the high frontier is that that program can benefit personally and directly and measurably every human being on Earth. There are other suggestions, some of which are basically repetitions in larger scale of the Apollo project, uh, very important uh, as, uh, as spectaculars to demonstrate the capabilities that technology has but involving very few people in a direct participating fashion. That their products would be to uh, bring TV programs to the Earth showing what's going on in distant space, and some peripheral science data, which I think one would have to say is pretty far from the scientific core subjects, where, which are, after all, the structure of the universe and the structure of life itself. I find it very relevant to the practicality of any long-term international space program that no nation or combination of nations has ever sustained any large-scale peaceful program over many decades unless that program had the promise of direct material benefit to the majority of its citizens. It doesn't really matter what the governmental form is in a particular country there is simply not going to be the sustained dedication to a long-term, large-scale, economically costly program unless that promise of material benefit for the majority of the citizens is seen. It just can't hold up otherwise. There are, I think, there is a uniqueness about opening up the solar system for human benefit, for human occupation, and for the generation of wealth and of energy there is a uniqueness there that no other possible space program can have, although the nice thing is that practically every other listed program that one can think of, which could be done internationally in space, would come out in a natural way from a large-scale expansion of the human race into the solar system. I think, and this is something which in the free discussion of ISU I think is appropriate for all of us to talk about together, I think there are potential strong implications for the expansion of human freedoms. We, we are in a, a world with a variety of governmental systems, most of which are in transition of one kind or another. Uh, right now, uh, one of the largest and strongest nations of the world, uh, which has been traditionally a rather closed society, uh, is going through the, the painful, difficult, but I think very rewarding uh, transition toward a more open society. I don't think it's an accident that uh, in the historical past that nation wanted cooperation in a program that was essentially a spectacular without direct human impact. Uh, I think in contrast it would be very good if we could win the support of that nation which is in transition and of the others uh, in opening up the solar system for human, uh, for human action and benefit. Uh, free societies flourish and expand on new frontiers. That's a traditional historical fact. One can see it in all of the world's literature. Dictatorships do not thrive in a frontier environment. I think that nations which aspire to 
transition from being closed to being more open uh, would do very well to support long-term cooperative programs which open up the new frontier of space because I think it will assist their own process of opening their own society. What about cultural goals? Well, as you know, no government will pay a great deal for culture for its own sake, unfortunately. But uh, it's an interesting fact, recently proven by a very detailed uh, doctoral thesis that's uh, just been completed, that every age of expansion and discovery involving large numbers of human beings moving out into a new frontier has sparked an explosion of creativity in the arts, in drama, in the uh, plastic arts, in sculpture, in painting, in music, and so on. The cross-cultural thesis, which was just completed by Mr. Jeffrey Fisk, uh, has shown that, that that theorem, that rule, transcends cultures and is true even in such very different cultures as that of uh, Western Europe and of Southeast Asia and over more than 2,000 years of time. So I see before us two basic choices. There can be more wars, more restrictions on individual freedom as we battle in what has to be a, a zero-sum game over the resources of our planet or a new flowering of opportunity with wealth for all humanity and the arts as we open a new frontier in space with more than a thousand times the land area and resources of planet Earth. Thank you. Greg, how are we to proceed now? Or is there to be uh, some question, or, or, uh, or should we have our panelists join us now? Fine, let's do that. Uh, we're going to show now a very brief film, which is uh, of the operation of the very first of the several mass drivers that have been developed, uh, partly under NASA support and in recent years under the support of the Space Studies Institute. The mass driver, as I think most of you know, is a machine for accelerating uh, macroscopic quantities of matter to escape speeds from planets. This film was taken here at MIT uh, some 10 years ago, and it shows the very first, very primitive mass driver of that time. That's the one which operated with 33 gravities of acceleration. And it's an indication of the progress that's been made over time. You saw that very high quality aerospace type switch. It was two bare <laughs> wires pushed together to make the first trigger. There was the acceleration process, and we're going to see a second shot, which will come up in a moment. Uh, Dr. Henry Colm here at MIT uh, led the group which assembled the actual physical machine itself. And that group included a number of uh, students from MIT and other places, all working as volunteers on the project. We then, that's Dr. Colm, we then uh, will move to uh, one of the biennial conferences uh, which are held at uh, Princeton University under the auspices of the Space Studies Institute. And there we'll see another firing of the, uh, of the mass driver. In seeing that, uh, I'd like to emphasize the progress that can be carried out in a few years of time by noting, as was shown in a slide earlier, that the second mass driver operated with an acceleration of about 500 gravities, and the third, which was operational by 1983, operated with an acceleration of 1,800 gravities. So that's how far it was possible to go in just about six years of time. 1,800 gravities means that you reach the lunar escape speed in only about 160 meters, a very practical distance for something built on the Earth and brought to the moon for operation. Here, the acceleration carrier of the mass driver is being lifted out of liquid nitrogen, where its uh, conducting coil is cooled to a low temperature for 
therefore low resistance to the flow of electric current. It's being put on the track. Of course, the more advanced Mass Driver 3 operated with no physical contact whatever with its guideway. I think the first thing that you're going to see is a failure because the, uh, the Mass Driver carrier, when put on the track, was so cold from the liquid nitrogen. And in a human day, rather like today at MIT, it, uh, it froze to the track. But all of the audience was very kind and very supportive. You'll see a number of our old friends there. I noticed Freeman Dyson in the front row. And the people operating the machine freed it up again, and the second firing was not a, a failure. Remember, you're looking at something which has only 1 60th the acceleration of the most modern one. That's what it looked like. That was the firing, the acceleration in about a tenth of a second uh, to about 100 miles per hour. Now the, the more advanced Mass Driver 3, the Mass Driver uh, carrier has embedded itself in a lead brick at the uh, end of the guideway. The more advanced Mass Driver 3, which was completed and successfully tested in 1983, operating at 1800 gravities, accelerated from zero to about 300 miles an hour in a length of half a meter and in a time of about seven one thousandths of a second. So that's characteristic of the first half meter of the lunar mass driver of 160 meter length. Uh, I have the pleasure now of, of having been joined by uh, Dr. Makoto Nagatomo, who's here at my left, Dr. William Brown, a uh, great expert on the microwave transmission of power, uh, Dr. Peter Glazer of Arthur D. Little, uh, who, besides uh, having designed many of the projects which were located as scientific experiments on the moon in the Apollo days, is also the inventor of the satellite solar power concept. And we panelists then will be in discussion, and I, I hope in open discussion with the group.